This episode is sponsored by viewers like you and Curiosity Stream. Stay tuned at the end of the video for more on how to get a discounted subscription. Hey, Safer here. A while ago, I started reviewing three Las Vegas history movies. Last time, it was Bugsy, which is by far the worst of these three. Aviator is weird, since it actually doesn't mention Las Vegas at all. So, how is it a Las Vegas movie? Well, I've got an expert I can call on that. I'm Mark Hall Patton. I'm the administrator of the Clark County Museum System, which means I run the Clark County Museum and the Howard W. Cannon Aviation Museum. One of the things when you're dealing with aviation history or local history in the Las Vegas Clark County area is that you have to deal with the history of Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes did fly into this area. He did own a number of casinos on the Strip. So I knew that the movie, because it supposedly was based on the life of Howard Hughes, was going to deal a little bit with the history of Las Vegas. Unfortunately, it dealt with it in the typical, oh, he was all nutso and he wasn't, not in the way that he was presented. They also presented him as having this uh, far-sighted sense that jets were the new wave of the future for commercial aviation. Something new. Jet airplanes. You know anything about jets? No, but it sounds expensive. Oh, it will be, but we gotta get started. He never believed in jets for commercial aviation. In fact, the fact that he was unwilling to allow TWA to move into jets was why he was forced out of TWA. And it was the reason that when he came into Las Vegas, he came into Las Vegas having the largest check ever cut to a single individual as of that point in time. Now, he had the money to start buying casinos here for cash. Now, you would not know that if you had watched the movie, but the movie wasn't about accuracy. Unfortunately, it was about presenting this poor individual as this caricature. So like, unfortunately, so many movies of this nature, all I can tell you is, don't go see it. It wasn't very good. Sorry. Yeah, well, I'm a bit more forgiving of the movie myself. Historians can always find something to argue about, after all. In fact, I wouldn't even go so far as to say it's bad. Honestly, the biggest problems with this film are its omissions, which I tend not to mind so much. But this one has some pretty glaring ones, and some time compression that makes no sense whatsoever. So there's problems for sure, but Howard Hughes's story has a lot of ambiguities that allow for some of this sensationalism, no matter how irksome that is to historians. Hughes was a deeply secretive man, and that fostered a lot of rumors. For most of those, we can parse them out, but because of the disputed nature of his biography, some we cannot. So here's a brief biography of the actual man as best as I can piece it together. Howard Hughes Sr. invented a drill bit that was extremely popular during the Texas oil boom. When he died, Howard Hughes Jr. withdrew from Rice University. Despite marrying the granddaughter of that college's namesake only a year later, he had to deal with the leftover tool company. This gave Hughes Jr. a bunch of money to play around with, and he certainly played around with it. He moved from Texas to LA to take advantage of the booming film industry there in the 1920s. As a producer for Paramount and United Artists, Hughes fit well in the studio system. He became just another millionaire playboy among the Hollywood elite, even publicly cheating on his wife and starlets, which led to a messy divorce in 1929. With a couple successful film productions, Hughes decided to step forward as director of his own passion project, Hell's Angels. He'd learned to fly after quitting college, and he used the film to indulge in that passion. They had a massive fleet of planes and pilots, doing all kinds of amazing stunts, some of which killed two people in the process. Because of reshooting for sound and weather delays, the budget ballooned to $2.8 million, the most expensive movie ever made at the time. Once it was released, it didn't make enough money, so Paramount had Hughes only produced Scarface instead of directing. 
He would direct again with The Outlaw, and eventually buy a large portion of RKO Pictures. But another business had piqued his interest. Because of all the aircraft in Hell's Angels, Hughes gained a greater appreciation of aviation. He created Hughes Aircraft Company in 1932 as a division of the Tool Company, and began development of a racer called H-1, which flew in 1935. Hughes actually flew the initial flight, and broke the land-based plane speed record at 352 miles per hour, but also crashed in the process. They repaired the craft, and Hughes would continue to break records, including the fastest flight between LA and New York in seven and a half hours. With a couple different planes in 1938, he circumnavigated the world in a mere 91 hours, setting another record. A year before that, the US Army put out a design specification for a twin-boom aircraft. Eventually, Lockheed created the P-38 to meet that call, but Hughes had his own design. His company started work at the same time as Lockheed, but it wasn't until World War II began that he received a contract for that design work. The first formulation was the D-2. After a few failed tests in 1943, the aircraft clearly needed a complete redesign. So they created a new plane called the XF-11. At the same time, the Army contracted Hughes to design a large cargo seaplane. Hughes called it the H-4 Hercules, but everyone knows it by a more derisive name, the Spruce Goose. So named because wartime material shortages required the plane to be mostly built out of wood. Hence the name Spruce. And it was absolutely massive, having the biggest wingspan of any plane ever created. Hey, Future Cypher here. Guess what? Even that superlative is apparently going too far, because last year, the Spruce Goose's record was beaten. Yes, this strange thing took flight in 2019. But both the XF-11 and Spruce Goose weren't completed during the war. Hughes flew the first test flight in the XF-11 in 1946, and promptly crashed it into Beverly Hills. This crash severely injured him, leaving lasting damage that would plague him to the end of his days. Since he was so bedridden, he redesigned hospital beds, with his new design becoming the basis of another one of his ventures, a medical research company, which still exists today, as well as his hospital bed being the basis of all designs that came after it. The dude was a modern-day polymath. Before the war, Hughes helped advise an up-and-coming aviation company called Transcontinental and Western Airlines. He started to buy stock at the urging of its CEO. By the 1940s, he was a majority owner. Hughes flew their first non-stop flight from California to Washington, D.C., with a Lockheed Constellation in 1944. Since the plane was pressurized, it could fly high above the weather and comfort. It was a real game-changer for airliners, and came just in time for the post-war boom. To celebrate their new ability to make longer flights, including to Europe, they renamed the company Transworld Airlines. But TWA was a minor company compared to its rival Pan American Airlines. Just after the war, the U.S. was looking to ensure her control over air traffic, and Congress thought a state-imposed monopoly would be just the trick. By letting Pan Am monopolize the airways, they thought America would be able to outcompete European and Soviet rivals. But of course, Hughes opposed monopolization, claiming it was communist. The chief proponent of that bill was also the head of the Senate War Investigation Committee, Owen Brewster. The amount of funding that went into the failures of the Spruce Goose and XF-11 left a lot of questions open about the mismanagement of government funds during the war. So Brewster summoned Hughes to the committee to explain these failures, with the possibility of dragging TWA through the mud in the process. Beforehand, Hughes went on a media campaign to discredit the committee, claiming Brewster was a stooge of Pan Am, and that the Monopoly Bill was a step toward communism. When he appeared in the Senate, he turned the tables on Brewster, constantly redirecting any inquiry into his malfeasance with government funds to the Monopoly Bill. Despite the fact that the committee had actually inquired into numerous other aircraft manufacturers in the same way. But Hughes won the publicity campaign, especially once he finally flew the Spruce Goose for the first and only time. I've put the sweat of my life into this thing. I have my reputation rolled up in it. And I have stated several times that if it's a failure, I'll probably leave this country and never come back, and I mean it. Despite such a triumphant position, Hughes languished. He avoided upgrades to TWA flights and took a pretty hands-off approach to RKO films, choosing to instead party around the booming Hollywood nightlife. 
he became infatuated with actress Jean Peters, and after years of him sending security guards to watch her, despite Hughes constantly going out with other women, they got together and married in 1957. Because of Hughes's delaying tactics with his company, they sought to force him out. Arkeo was the first. They suffered because he was a huge red baiter, which led to him supporting Congress's hunt for Hollywood communists with his own company, often using it to ward off malfeasance charges from his subordinates. It was so bad that Walt Disney pulled out of a distribution deal with Arkeo, and Disney was quite the red baiter himself. As a stock ownership battle commenced in the 1950s, everyone pretty much hated Hughes's control. RKO quickly fell from grace, and Hughes sold the company for a paltry $25 million in 1955, eventually stopping movie production only a few years later. Next on the chopping block was TWA. Hughes delayed updating their airplanes till it was financially impossible to compete against jets. He first tried to make his own airliners, which failed miserably, and finally gave in to the Boeing 707. Even then, he refused to give stock options to finance the jet planes. It turned into a whole debacle, so TWA's board of directors forced him out, despite him owning 78% of the company. Next, they tried to get rid of his ownership by suing the Hughes Tool Company for monopolistic practices, claiming the aircraft division used TWA as a captive market. But Hughes wasn't going to be dragged into a lengthy legal battle. Instead, he became a recluse. He had severe obsessive-compulsive disorder, and the physical trauma from the XF-11 crash made him increasingly addicted to painkillers, so he could claim that the OCD and drugs kept him from appearing in court, despite having operated for a decade and a half without going into hiding. A default judgment was issued in 1963, but the Supreme Court vacated it in 1973 because Hughes had never testified. He remained a recluse to avoid being subpoenaed, so TWA wrote him a check for $546,549,771, all to pay for his stocks in 1966. Suffice it to say, Hughes was flush with cash, and he was hiding in the Desert Inn's penthouse suite in Las Vegas. When the Desert Inn tried to evict him, he instead bought the hotel itself. This was a turning point in Las Vegas history, for Hughes realized he could buy up casinos and make tons of legitimate money through corporate ownership. Many casinos couldn't get the loans they needed from business interests because of a general prejudice against gambling, but Hughes led the way for changing that perception. His company quickly became the largest property owner in the Las Vegas Valley, thereby eliminating the need for mob funding. He also bought a couple other airliners, but stayed fairly hands-off from their everyday running. From the 1960s onward, he became more reclusive. His OCD and drug addiction worsened during this sequestration. He made stranger and stranger demands of his staff, like taping the drapes down and extremely exacting food handling instructions. He even tried to stop underground nuclear testing, not out of real environmental concerns, but to avoid the uncleanliness that the distant tests supposedly caused. Because of this isolation, Gene Peters divorced him in 1970, and we don't exactly know what his life was like from here on out. Rumors flew about all the strange things he did, like peeing in jars and constantly remaining naked. The rumors were so rampant that a reporter simply faked a memoir of Hughes and managed to fool the public into thinking it was authorized. By 1976, Hughes had traveled to numerous hotels worldwide, but always kept in utter secrecy. Clearly, his helpers increasingly neglected him, and he died that year in deplorable conditions. The autopsy found severe emaciation, lack of hygiene such as clearly not showering for weeks at a time and not having trimmed his nails until they snapped off, and worst of all, several broken needles were found under his skin. From such an important figure, he died in ignominious conditions. Hugh's life after becoming a recluse is a bit difficult to parse out. People who knew him in Las Vegas report entirely different circumstances. For instance, the Crockett's, who founded what would become McCarran Airport, were happy to let Hughes babysit for them. But that seems to be contradicted by what his helpers reported. Of course, those same helpers were the ones that left him in such horrendous conditions that he died. 
but it's difficult to ignore the heavy drug usage, nor is it easy to sympathize with the kind of crazy those helpers had to deal with. He was certainly OCD, but that didn't seem to affect him too much until the 1960s. Biographers have to navigate this torrent of contradictory information carefully, but of course, the general public doesn't care about history. And all through the long years, not a shadow was seen moving in that window. The good people of Las Vegas kept their eyes peeled, saw nothing, and believed everything they told each other. At four o'clock in the morning, promenading this highway, with no socks on, and wearing, instead of shoes, a pair of empty Kleenex boxes. Do I believe that? <laughs> Huh, weird. I just noticed that these two look kinda similar. Whoa, weird. Slap in Slavoj Zizek and you got a trifecta right there. What was he doing up there? What were they doing to him? If he broke his silence, would it be a... cry for help? Layman take these rumors at face value, hence why the memoir hoax was so readily accepted at the time. Even today, much of these rumors are derived from that falsification. Biographers have to separate surreptitious fact from lurid fiction. But documentaries are completely willing to fall down the rabbit hole of misconception, and there have been a lot of documentaries on Hughes. I think this movie was based on one such documentary called Howard Hughes' The Man and the Madness. It's difficult to tell since the sourcing isn't listed, but the documentary makes the same mistakes the movie does. It came out five years prior and was very popular, making the timing perfect. History takes time to make. <laughs> and documentarians were unwilling to wait. I did make you a promise, remember? I did promise that for one hour, I tell you only the truth. That hour, ladies and gentlemen, is over. For the past 17 minutes, I've been lying my head off. And yes, I timed that out perfectly. So some of the movie's problems are more forgivable, simply because of the limits of information they had at hand. Plus, it does get plenty correct. The way The Aviator depicts his production of Hell's Angels is pretty spot on. He was wildly spending money for absolute perfection. Tell you an additional 1.7 million, we got that much? No. Of course, what it doesn't show is that he honestly believed that the film would make back its money, which it eventually did with re-showings. But the weird things like requiring exactly the right cloud cover. Clouds move! That's what they do! They move! See that? It is costing me $5,271 a day to keep those planes on the ground. You find me some goddamn clouds, huh? And how dangerous the whole endeavor was is correct. Though it would be prudent to show that two pilots died in the making of it. So there was a real human cost, which the movie doesn't show. The two crashes that are shown are also quite accurate, including the extensive effects of Hughes's injuries. He has burns to 78% of his body. Nine ribs are shattered, not broken, shattered. His are his nose, his chin, his cheek, his left knee, his left elbow. He has 60 lacerations on his face to the bone. His chest was crushed, so his left lung has collapsed and his heart has shifted entirely to the right side of his chest cavity. Jesus, God. There's a reason why he became addicted to painkillers, which so adversely affected him in his later years. Hughes's nightlife is also well depicted, including a great portrayal of Katherine Hepburn. It's a real standout role. The movie can't show all the philandering Hughes did, but he certainly did a lot of it. I also like that it shows the old jalopy that Hughes drove in and why. But then I get all dolled up and we have to go out in this old jalopy without a hood. That's really good stuff. And something spectacular, when you know what it is, is how Martin Scorsese did the color grading to look like two-strip Technicolor. These scenes look like they've got odd coloring because at the time, that's what color movies looked like. The first feature length color film in the United States came in 1917, but the weird tinting and high expense kept movies from using the process. It wasn't until the late 1930s when three strip Technicolor became popular and that's when the movie switches to a full color palette, meant to look like old Technicolor. It's pretty cool. But with all this, there's some pretty big problems.
Generally, the main problem with this film is what it leaves out of the story. Now, normally, I don't mind omissions, unless they affect the narrative, which these do. For instance, we never hear about his wife, which substantially alters how the viewer would perceive his philandering. His red baiting never becomes part of the story, despite it being his most prominent role in the late 1940s. The film even makes it seem like Hughes just got the idea to buy TWA out of the blue. What does control and interest in TWA cost me? Call it 15 million. You have not start buying. Howard, hold on. Are you sure? You want to think about it for five minutes? We also don't see his drug abuse, which makes it appear that Hughes's descent into madness is purely from his OCD. That's completely false and quite a mischaracterization. With this mischaracterization comes another problem I'm typically lenient on, time compression. Sometimes you just have to compress time to make it fit into a movie's limited length. That's what documentaries can avoid, since they can rely on narration to convey the story where a movie can't. But then there's what this film does. It shows Hugh's reclusive time as though it was before the Brewster hearings. That was in Las Vegas two or three decades later. You're more than 20 years off the mark, movie! By the way, this is why it's a Las Vegas movie, because they're depicting something that happened in Las Vegas, just out of time and out of place. Furthermore, though much of what is depicted has been reported happening in the 1960s and 70s, I'll remind the viewer that is heavily disputed. Hughes went into hiding to escape a lawsuit. From there, it's conjecture when he became crazy and how far he got. That conjecture is up to the movie to navigate. But they cannot depict it as before the Brewster hearings, and certainly not in Los Angeles. That was in Las Vegas. That completely distorts the story, and since we don't see Hughes's media push beforehand, he comes out looking like a troubled genius. A stereotype Hollywood loves and gets wrong almost every time. Yet from the 1940s onward, he was pretty hands-off. When Hughes Aeronautics got more government contracts to build all kinds of stuff, like the predecessor to the Sidewinder missile, or their creation of civilian satellites, the namesake of the company was not involved. Yet the movie has the gall to show this as the final scene. Whoever can start utilizing jet technology on commercial airliners is going to win all the marbles. No. Just no. That's exactly the opposite of reality. Hughes in the 50s was more concerned with being a playboy than an entrepreneur, which is exactly what got him sacked. So there's some huge problems with this film. But as I said in the beginning, it's more because of the filmmakers following legend than truth. There's a lot of disputed history here, and it's difficult to navigate. What the film does well, it does really well. But what it does poorly makes for some glaring holes in the plot. Ultimately, it's not horrendous. After all, Hughes was certainly a troubled genius. Just not as early as the film portrays. I'd like to thank CuriosityStream for sponsoring this video. They are a documentary streaming service with thousands of titles to go through. You can use it on any device like your TV, phone, and computer. They don't only cover history, but a whole range of topics from science and nature documentaries to stuff like economics and philosophy. With 35 curated collections, they'll get you on your way to discover more. In correlation to today's episode, I'd recommend checking out Pioneers of Aviation. This series talks about the aviation industry as a whole, because Howard Hughes was actually a fairly small part of that story. This looks at the various companies that drove the American aviation industry, eventually getting us to the moon. If you click on the link below and use code CYNICALHISTORIAN, you'll get a discount on a year's subscription. It only costs 15 bucks for the entire year. And they'll keep adding stuff all the time, so why not go check them out? If you like this channel, you'll certainly like documentaries. Thanks to them for sponsoring this video, and I'll see you all next time.